I'm Matt Turek. I'm a program manager at, uh, at DARPA. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. We're technically part of the Department of Defense. Uh, DARPA was uh, started in 1958 in response to Sputnik. Uh, that was a technical event that caught us uh, by surprise, uh, caught the US government, uh, even caught uh, perhaps part of the technical community by surprise. And uh, so DARPA was stood up uh, to prevent uh, such strategic surprise. So that's, uh, that's the goal of the agency at a high level. Uh, and we fund a number of research uh, efforts uh, to help us understand the technical space uh, and uh, to prevent such strategic surprise. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, detection, attribution, and characterization of falsified media. Uh, this is probably going to be a broad topic for this particular uh, audience, but I wanted to give you a perspective on, uh, on threats and on technical approaches. Uh, and then happy to take uh, questions at the end uh, that are perhaps more, uh, more specific, uh, I guess, to the, the focus of this uh, conference. So um, with that, let me, uh, let me, get, a, let me get into it. Um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, image and video uh, manipulations. So on the top part of the slide here, you see the progress that has been made in uh, image synthesis. These very explicitly is just uh, results from generative adversarial networks or GANs. Uh, you uh, may or may not be familiar with those. Uh, the, uh, GAN, the first GAN paper was uh, done by Ian Goodfellow back in 2014 when he was at Google. Uh, and then you could see that over the last few years, we've really seen rapid progress in the ability to create uh, synthetic images uh, with GANs. Uh, so GANs are, in general, a, a machine learning approach. Uh, they can be used for multiple things. Uh, you know, uh, generating synthetic data uh, is certainly something that is uh, within the sweet spot of GANs. Um, you know, the last, what's, uh, I guess, driving this uh, really is uh, both the machine learning community. Uh, so it is a technical tool that is useful in a number of ways in the machine learning community, not, uh, not necessarily for uh, malicious purposes, um, but for uh, generating training data for learning about uh, data distributions. It's also being driven by the entertainment industry. Uh, those last couple papers there, 2017, 2018, 2019, that's all work done by NVIDIA. Um, so that's the same company that makes uh, GPUs, um, and they are also doing uh, research in the machine learning space. Um, so we've gone from very low resolution images. So those are the 2014 ones were 128 or 256 pixels on a side and grayscale. And you can see that they're blurry and low resolution. And, and now, uh, you know, this is even now a couple years old, uh, 2019 timeframe. Uh, you know, 2,000, 4,000 pixels on a side, photorealistic uh, type uh, images. We've seen similar progress on the video manipulation side, uh, even predating things like deep fakes. Uh, there was uh, work in 2016 on a technique called face to face, uh, which uh, enabled the real time copy of uh, the face from a source to a target, including the deformations of that face, like the mouth movements. Uh, 2017 is when the term deep fakes was coined. Uh, that, uh, that was a result of someone uh, publishing some software on Reddit. Uh, that software basically copied the face and its uh, deformations from uh, a source to target uh, using, uh, using an autoencoder machine learning approach. Uh, that work has been since extended. Uh, for instance, the work in 2018, uh, Chan et al., that's from Berkeley where you could think about taking the same sort of approach on deep fakes, but not just copying the face, but copying an entire body pose uh, from source to target. Uh, and then some work in uh, 2019 from uh, researchers at Stanford, uh, where they could edit the transcript of a video in order to change the mouth movements of the speaker in the video. So it doesn't do the audio, but it does do the mouth movements. And in this case, this is actually an example taken from their paper. Uh, they use it to alter uh, a speaker talking about the stock price of Apple, uh, reducing it from $191.45 uh, uh, to $182.25. You know, if that was a, a real world event, that would reflect like a $40, uh, $40 billion hit to Apple's market cap. 
you know, if you had a significant uh, figure, perhaps someone related to the company making such a comment, you could imagine the impact it might have on uh, the stock market, for instance. And again, a lot of this is being driven by uh, the machine learning research uh, community. So this is uh, best paper honorable mention for one of those uh, generative adversarial network papers. Again, this is work done by the team at, in NVIDIA. Um, and it just highlights the quote from the award committee highlights uh, very specifically the breakneck pace in recent years in, uh, in creating these sorts of uh, technologies. One of the problems is that uh, it's pretty easy now to take something like that research publication and the software that's being shared and, uh, and use that to enable real world attacks. Uh, so the sharing of the software is a good thing from a research reprodu reproducibility standpoint, um, but that also enables folks to take that software and use it for nefarious purposes. In this case, it's not really a nefarious purpose, but there's a website, this person does not exist.com uh, that you may have seen that basically generates a synthetic face every time you refresh it. Um, and I'll show you some instances in upcoming slides of where that sort of capability has been used uh, or I perhaps more appropriately should say uh, is being misused. So, um, you know, that gives you a sense of sort of the pace of uh, media manipulation technologies. You might ask yourselves, well, are we actually seeing uh, those manipulation technologies being used in the wild? And the reality is we are. Um, so on the top portion of the slide, these are really more manual manipulation techniques. Uh, the bottom portion of the slide is automated manipulation techniques. And, you know, way back in 2014, uh, you know, there was manipulated media around the downing of the MH17 aircraft. That media started in a, a, a Russian uh, sort of chat room uh, and then was uh, eventually debunked by an open source uh, organization, Bellingcat, which, uh, you know, does very detailed research into uh, media and uh, news stories, uh, oftentimes around uh, military events. Um, now, I don't think we know exactly how that uh, media was created, but likely it was using a tool like Photoshop or GIMP. Um, you know, another example, we've seen uh, a lot of manipulated media, uh, even outside or maybe uh, most particularly outside the US uh, around things like uh, political events and elections. Uh, so the example here is from the Catalan independence movement in 2017. Uh, so this photo is actually manipulated. The flag was never there. That was inserted into the scene. Uh, and that was done to strike a chord with the audience and perhaps uh, encourage the media to go viral. Um, you know, it wasn't just sort of an incidental edit and it's done for, uh, for reasons, again, to amplify a particular message. Uh, and again, likely done with something like Photoshop. Uh, a more recent example is uh, the post on the right-hand side. This is from Twitter. Uh, this is from a, a, Chinese, a verified Chinese government account um, where they're calling attention to some of the issues around um, Australia's soldiers and their interactions with Afghan uh, civilians and prisoners. But the image here is of an Australian soldier holding a knife to a, a young girl. This image, you can tell just by looking at the elements, is clearly manipulated. Uh, this, is not a, uh, this is not a real image. And again, likely generated with something like Photoshop. But it's pretty interesting that this is being used by a verified government account as part of their approach to getting out their message. On the bottom half of the slide, in terms of automated manipulation techniques, uh, you know, one of the early examples of deepfakes was Jordan Peele's uh, Obama deepfake video. So that used, that's uh, really was sort of a semi-automated approach. So that used uh, Jordan Peele as a voice actor uh, to create the, uh, the manipulated video of Obama. And then the deep fake uh, technique really handled the manipulations in terms of the uh, image or the pixels. Another uh, example is uh, this uh, uh, Katie Jones profile that popped up on LinkedIn in 2019. Uh, so this was eventually debunked by a journalist um, but this uh, persona, uh, Katie Jones, popped up on LinkedIn, uh, had the face that you see associated with it as a profile photo. Uh, 
attributed itself to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is a relatively well-regarded Washington, D.C. think tank. And then this account started reaching out to high-profile individuals in the U.S. government and was actually successful in connecting with a number of them. Turns out that this uh, face is actually one of those synthetically generated faces. So this is an example of those, uh, those sorts of GAN uh, techniques uh, being used in the wild. Uh, another example of the GAN techniques is on the far right side. This is uh, some work done by Graphica, which is a, a company that does social media analytics. Um, and uh, they found evidence of a pro-Chinese inauthentic network on Facebook uh, that had a number of these uh, GAN generated faces as their profile images. And then uh, coming back uh, just before that, I think one of the most compelling deep fakes that I've seen uh, was this uh, uh, Nixon moon speech. So if you go to moondisaster.org, if you haven't seen this, uh, this is a very compelling deep fake. It takes a speech that was written in the event that the astronauts did not return from the moon. So it was a real speech that was written but never given. And they created a deep fake of uh, President Nixon uh, delivering that speech. It took them six months worth of effort to do that and a trained actor, um, but it is a very compelling uh, result. So the uh, challenges that we've seen in this space and what really drove DARPA to start the media forensics program, which was our, uh, I guess, first significant investment in this space was a combination of a couple, a couple things. One was essentially exponential growth in visual content that was being uploaded to social media, uh, primarily from things like cell phone cameras, and then a large imbalance in the number of tools that supported creating manipulations of media uh, versus the number of tools that were available to help uh, authenticate media. Uh, and so there's an example on the bottom portion of the slide, uh, some tools that were developed by a European consortium, INVID, uh, which takes in a image and then runs it through a number of analysis algorithms and creates visualizations uh, to perhaps cue an experienced analyst as to whether the image was manipulated or not. The challenge with that is it still requires human eyeballs on uh, the visualizations to make a decision, and so it doesn't scale well. So one of the things that Metaphor was focused on uniquely was a quantitative measure of integrity so that we could do things like filtering and uh, prioritization and triage of media. So I'm going to talk about how uh, sort of DARPA has uh, framed our approach to media integrity. This is uh, particular to Metaphor. I'll talk more about the follow on semantic forensics program uh, towards the very end of the talk. So on metaphor, we were looking at multiple aspects of media integrity, in this case, images and video, digital integrity, uh, looking essentially at really low level indicators of whether a image or video was manipulated. So it might be things like blurred edges or signals from compression. It turns out that things like generative adversarial networks and even some of the deep fake approaches leave behind statistical fingerprints that it's relatively easy for machine learning approaches to find and uh, classify some of that media as manipulated. The problem is, is that those signatures are very fragile. So if you do things like compress or resize uh, or you know, other sort of normal image uh, operations, you can actually destroy those uh, signatures that some of the detectors rely on. So it's important to have other aspects as well. So things like physical integrity. Uh, here we're asking, are the laws of physics violated? And the example uh, up above is from uh, is two hovercrafts. Uh, so you have two objects that are essentially the same object. They're moving through the same physical medium, in this case, the water. And in one instance, it's leaving behind a wake. In the other case, it's not leaving behind a wake. So that's suspicious. Um, you can think about this more generally uh, along the lines of things like lighting and shadows. Are the lighting and shadows consistent? Is the uh, vanishing point uh, how parallel lines converge in an image taken by a camera? Is that uh, consistent or not? And then the third area that we were looking at on metaphor was semantic integrity. So from a metaphor perspective, this is where we brought other information to bear to uh, either support or dispute a hypothesis about a media asset. Um, and so for instance, if you know where and when an image was taken, um, you uh, might be able to estimate, and it's outside, you might be able to estimate, for instance, the sun angle and see if that's uh, consistent. Or you might see if the weather is consistent with the location or time of uh, the media acquisition. 
We also built uh, what we referred to as integrity reasoning approaches. So those are approaches to combine information across uh, a wide range of detectors and these uh, various levels of media integrity. And so let me uh, give you some concrete examples of some of the algorithms that were developed on Metaphor. Uh, so on the digital integrity side, this is work done by the University of Naples. This was a deep learning algorithm that basically looked at pairs of patches of pixels in the scene to see if they had consistent noise signatures or not. And so that sort of approach is able to detect and actually segment uh, the airplane that was added into the scene. On the physical integrity side, this is work done by the University of Maryland. The image here is actually a single frame from a video that's uh, composite. So the camera was put on a tripod. Uh, video was taken at two different times of day uh, with two different individuals and then composited together. Uh, there's actually some outside light in this scene, which shows up in terms of the lighting angle on the faces. And so the technique that University of Maryland developed automatically finds the faces in the scene, uh, comes up with approximate 3D models of the face and uses that to back out the lighting angles to see whether they're consistent or inconsistent. And in this case, the lighting's inconsistent. That's indicated by the uh, arrows uh, above the individual's head. Uh, also work done by University of Maryland was uh, in the semantic integrity example. So that is a uh, outdoor scene where there's a GPS location and a timestamp that's available with it. And University of Maryland built a deep neural network that could estimate things like weather properties, um, you know, temperature, humidity, uh, cloud cover, um, just from the pixels. And so you can estimate those properties from the image using the GPS and timestamp. You can go into a weather database and see what the weather was for that particular location and see if it's inconsistent uh, or consistent. We also worked on uh, provenance algorithms. Uh, so you might be familiar with things like reverse image search from Google, where you can associate images together by appearance. Those typically look at the entirety of the image uh, to make the comparison. So metaphor focused on uh, portions of the image, so small object detection and indexing. So that might be the case where there are shared elements in the scene, but not the, uh, the predominant scene content is, uh, is not the same. Uh, so that might be the case if you copy an object from one scene to another, or uh, portions of the scene is perhaps in the background of another, uh, another image. We also did work on something uh, called camera ID. Uh, so uh, each uh, camera detector, because of uh, properties of the silicon, has slightly different response uh, to light. Uh, so photo uh, response non-uniformities is what the technical term is. You can use that to actually associate an image to a particular acquisition device in certain cases. Um, and again, those are those sort of statistical fingerprints that I mentioned, so they can be fragile to compression and other approaches. Um, but it gives us, in, again, in certain cases, the ability to associate an image to a particular acquisition device. And then uh, electrical network frequency. So if you take a video indoors, you are actually capturing information about uh, the indoor lighting. And it might flicker, uh, representing the the frequency of the power grid that it's on. And so you can back out things like whether it's on a 50 or 60 Hertz grid. And if you have other sensor data, you can even start doing rough geolocalization around uh, perhaps this was taken in a particular city um, or uh, region. So one of the other things that, uh, that we did on the program was lay out an adversarial landscape. Um, so this is really just a, a notional plot of uh, what it takes in terms of an adversary's skill and resources to create particular types of manipulations. And then you can locate on this plot uh, particular organizations or individuals and then technical capabilities. And really what you'll start to see from this, uh, from this exercise is that things like deep fakes and GANs have really lowered the bar in terms of the skill and resources necessary uh, to create a potentially compelling manipulation. Um, and then, you know, there's a number of other techniques uh, uh, on here as well. Um, if you take a look at the 
defensive techniques that we developed on metaphor, they actually illustrate that we covered the space in a number of ways. Uh, so this was actually an exercise that we did at the end of the program. It's something that we're looking at much more proactively now on semaphore, which is essentially understanding the trade-offs between resources and skills uh, to understand what are realistic threats both now and in the future. And what does that mean about how we need to build uh, defensive technologies? So I'm gonna go through a number of examples of, uh, of tools that came out of the metaphor program. So this is an example, uh, sort of a dated uh, screenshot now of what the prototype metaphor system uh, user interface looked like. Uh, so the user interface lived in a web browser. Um, on the back end, there was cloud compute of parallel algorithms that uh, could process image and video and produce that quantitative integrity score that I mentioned. So on the left-hand side, a gallery of images. In the middle, the image uh, that you're interested in under review. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see a, a whole range of detectors. Each of them are producing integrity scores. So low numbers, low integrity, we think it's manipulated high scores. High integrity, we think it's not manipulated. Same thing for some of the masks, black pixels, low integrity. Um, and those provide uh, for some of the algorithms an indication of where we think the manipulation occurred. And then in the upper right hand corner, there's a fused uh, result. Um, and so that, again, combines information across a number of the detectors. Um, so here's that here's a frame from that uh, in event of moon disaster. Uh, if you process that video through some of the metaphor analytics. Uh, so this uh, is one of the analytics here, uh, the CNN based uh, video face forgery detector, again, uh, done by uh, University of Naples. Um, it uh, it calls your attention to the fact that uh, in cases where Nixon is on the screen, that's where this red bar shows up. So that's where the algorithm actually thinks that the video has been manipulated. Um, so that allows us to localize temporally where we think the manipulation is in this video. Um, there's a couple other frames here. If you go back prior to Nixon coming into the scene, uh, that's the algorithm thinks that that uh, video may be authentic. Uh, if you look at another video from that uh, same group, this is the actor who was doing the puppeteering of Nixon. And so this video has clips of the actor intermixed with clips of Nixon. And so that's why you see this intermix of sort of blue and red elements. Uh, these red elements are, are uh, places where uh, Nixon shows up where they use the deep fake uh, technology. Um, Another uh, tool that was uh, produced on the program uh, was uh, called Olive. This was worked on by SRI. This was uh, originally an audio analysis tool. Uh, they incorporated some video uh, capabilities into the uh, system where they can estimate whether the video was taken indoors or out, outside um, based on appearance. And similarly with the audio, you can, uh, you can analyze for things like um, echoes or reverberations that give you indications of whether the video was taken inside or not. Uh, and then you can look for inconsistencies in that. Uh, there was a, a small business, EduWorks, that built a, uh, a mobile application for doing voice phishing detection. So this not only looks for sig signatures of manipulated audio, but also uh, now they're starting to look at content analysis so that they can understand whether this is uh, perhaps a social engineering attack uh, that someone is trying to carry out on the phone based on the types of questions that are being asked. Uh, we also did work on uh, commercial satellite uh, image analysis. Um, and so this was a tool built by Kitware that incorporated a number of algorithms from the metaphor system to look and see if uh, commercial satellite images had indications of uh, manipulation or not. And then uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, highlight uh, the very nice work that was done by uh, the Purdue team. Uh, I'm sure Ed gave a very nice uh, talk the other day on this, on uh, the tool that they built uh, for HHS to analyze scientific publications, to extract the images, uh, to associate them together using those provenance techniques, and also to look for, uh, for signs of manipulation. We also built, uh, this was work done by uh, UC Berkeley and uh, Kitware, uh, 
they built uh, algorithms that created soft biometric models for specific individuals. So the soft biometric models looked at things like how the head moved, how the facial muscles move. Those tend to be unique uh, for on an individual by individual basis. And so you can use that to differentiate an impersonator uh, from the real individual or an impersonator plus deep fakes from that real individual. In this case, this is a professional Obama impersonator that the system has detected as a impersonator. So that's on the image and video side. We're starting to see growing capabilities on uh, manipulation on text and audio. Uh, so the left-hand example here is um, from a undergrad student who had research access to GPT-3. So that's one of these large scale language models and used it to create a fake blog. That blog was upvoted on Hacker News by thousands of individuals. So that, you know, while he was cherry picking the results out of that uh, synthetic generation algorithm, they were good enough that they fooled a large number of individuals. Um, we've also seen in the wild the use of synthetic audio techniques uh, where uh, about $240,000 was stolen from a UK company. Um, essentially, the attack. Um, occurred by phone, uh, the, uh, the phone call was impersonating the CEO of the company and, and putting time pressure on someone to uh, execute a wire transfer. Um, and, uh, and that was how the, the funds were stolen. Uh, and then on the right hand side is a, a nice article by Rene Duresta, who's a, a researcher in this space, um, both highlighting uh, GPT-3's response to some of the issues. So again, synthetically generated text uh, and making the comment about, you know, what happens when uh, automated techniques allow these, uh, this sort of disinformation uh, to be created uh, essentially for free. So the supply becomes uh, infinite. So here's an example of one of those large language models. This is uh, T5, which is a text to text transformer models. These have a large number of parameters. So they take a, quite a bit of memory and quite a bit of compute to store and execute. Uh, but they're basically trained in, in, uh, in terms of multiple machine learning tasks. It might be translation, it might be grading sen sentences, uh, it might be doing question answering, uh, but that's basically how these, uh, how these models are built. Um, you know, one of the state-of-the-art models in this space is GPT-3 that I mentioned. Because of the size of these models and the amount of compute uh, required to build them, not everyone has access to them. So this state-of-the-art language model was about 355 GPU years of compute to train this through once. So that's not the entire exploration process. That's just training it end-to-end -end once. And if you did that with cloud compute, it's about $4.6 million. So again, there's a lot of uh, resources needed to create one of these state-of-the-art language models. So from an attack standpoint, that means uh, they are not going to be common right now, but of course that cost of compute, the ability to create uh, perhaps compelling models with a uh, smaller number of parameters, smaller compute required, that will uh, continue to advance. So, you know, what sort of threats might we see as a result of this? Well, you know, you could think about amplifying that Jordan Peele example. Again, that required a lot of uh, sort of semi-automated work to create required Jordan Peele as a voice actor, for instance. If you can uh, automate that end to end and do that at scale, that en would enable someone to do something like uh, targeted personal attacks. Uh, on the right hand side, the far right, there's, uh, there's a sort of a further example of this. So there's uh, a concept that's out there already, although we haven't seen this attack in the wild, a concept called ransom fake. So this is a mashup of ransomware plus deep fake. And essentially, it's a synthetic blackmail threat. I'm going to destroy your reputation with this forged media unless you pay me money. Um, so obviously, that's of interest uh, to the US government around protecting its uh, leadership and personnel. Um, but there is opportunity for this uh, to go after uh, industry leaders, uh, for instance. Um, and so that is uh, perhaps one of the future attack vectors. Another element uh, that uh, could occur with, again, with advances in these large scale language models, with the advances in the generation of uh, media is uh, 
news stories about events that never happened and the ability to generate those at scale, multiple news stories about the same event, making it seem like it happened uh, and being able to do that on a, on a regular rhythm. Um, so these are some of the examples of, uh, of threats that might be enabled by the advances in media manipulation uh, capabilities. One of the uh, things that we're still seeing though from the generators is what we've termed uh, semantic errors. So the face on the left-hand side, if you look at it closely, that's actually one of those GAN generated faces. The woman's earrings are different. Now that could happen in the real world, uh, but it doesn't happen frequently. That might be a clue that the media is, uh, is manipulated. On the right-hand side, this is an example of an Airbnb ad. This is fully synthetically generated. The images are generated, the text is generated, the profile photo is generated. And you see that I've highlighted a couple uh, elements there. So the bathroom has seating for two more people and the Airbnb has 24 seven carpeting. Um, so these are the sort of semantic inconsistencies that language models make right now. We might find them humorous as humans uh, because we understand those inconsistencies, but these are the sorts of errors that generators are making. And there's an opportunity here that we're hoping to exploit by building defensive uh, capabilities that can look for these sorts of uh, semantic errors. And so that takes us on to uh, sort of a notional problem here. This is a, uh, how we sort of frame the space for that semantic forensics program. So think about an online news story where it's got text and video and audio and uh, an image associated with it. And now you need to start looking at that media asset, that collection of text and audio and, and images, et cetera, and start seeing if, uh, if there's uh, semantic inconsistencies in it. So you could look at it and it points out, well, there's a protest. Is there evidence for a protest? Well, you see there's a large number of people in the crowd, in the video and in the image, they're holding signs. You hear the cheering of the crowd and the audio. Well, that seems like there's evidence for it. That seems supported. What about the fact that it was violent? Well, you could run something like activity recognition on the crowd and analyze their behavior. You might notice that there's children in the crowd, that there's people hugging in the image, that the audio talks about welcoming people. Uh, so that seems inconsistent with the notion of this uh, protest being uh, violent. What other things could you look at? Well, on semaphore, we're interested in not just detection, but we're interested in attribution. Does media come from where it says it came from? And characterization, was this done for malicious purposes? So on the attribution side, what could you do? Well, maybe you know that Bob Smith is a tech reporter, so he's unlikely to write on this topic. Maybe you further know that if he did write on it, he would use different vocabulary. Maybe he's a snarky writer like tech reporters often are. And so this just isn't written with the sort of style that Bob Smith would use. Um, maybe Newswire has a different style for how they, uh, their editorial style that's evident in the text or how they use and incorporate media into the uh, news story. So all of those can be uh, cues that uh, perhaps this was uh, generated or manipulated. What about uh, characterization? Was this done for malicious purposes? Well, we see that there's a large number of semantic inconsistencies, so that's suspicious, but maybe it's not enough. There's the, we pointed out that uh, use of the unsupported term violent, that's interesting because that's probably in there to, to uh, create a real world reaction, uh, perhaps to encourage the media to go viral. And then they also tried to source this to a notional news organization here, Newswire. But imagine that that was a high credibility news organization. Um, you know, that's also suspicious uh, that they're trying to attribute this work uh, to them again, uh, perhaps to go viral or to, to gain more credibility in the real world. So those are all indicators uh, that, you can, uh, that you can look at uh, for whether uh, this might have been uh, uh, falsified in some way. Um, so with that, I will uh, wrap up uh, the semaphore program that I was just talking about uh, kicked off uh, this past August. Uh, it will continue, it's a four year program, so it'll continue for several years. Um, we're looking first at news and social media, but part of the agenda on that program is actually to look at technical documents. Uh, it might not be technical papers, it might be more like news stories, uh, but that will give us an opportunity to engage uh, with this community uh, specifically. And with that, I'm happy to take questions.